what is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video. And in this video, I'm going to be building a budget gaming PC that you can actually buy the parts for right now in 2021. I'll be covering off all the components I chose and why, and how you can buy them in budget for this system. I'll be showing you guys how to put it together from start right through to finish, covering off everything from the installation process to the cables, wiring, BIOS, drivers, you name it, we're going to cover it in this video. I'll also be testing out the system with some of my favourite games and some of your guys' favourite titles too, giving you the important benchmark numbers. So without any further ado, let's dive into it, after a quick ad from today's video sponsor. Corsair's M65 RGB Ultra Wireless builds upon the legendary M65 design with the latest Corsair Slipstream Wireless tech and much more. With a 26,000 DPI Corsair Marksman sensor that can be adjusted in DPI steps as small as one, this mouse means business. Adjustable weight allows you to find your perfect center of gravity, while Omron optical switches deliver hyper-fast and precise responses. Everything you love about the M65 in 2021, now wireless. Check it out at the links in the description below. As usual, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a rundown of all the component choices first before we proceed and put the system together. Let's start things off with our motherboard and GPU. At the heart of this build is Gigabyte's B450M S2H. This is one of the best budget B450 boards on the market. And some of you might be confused why I'm promoting this rather than the newer B550. Simply put, you don't need B550 for this build. We don't need any expensive Gen 4 storage. We don't need loads of USB-C, loads of overclock and headroom or anything like that. We just need a board with plenty of connectivity, support for the latest GPUs, and enough RAM to keep the system ticking over. It's going to pair up really nicely with this Gigabyte RX 5600 XT, the GPU choice for today's build. I'll be covering off later exactly how I managed to pick this up in budget. Now, of course, you are going to pay more for a card like this now than you would have a year ago. GPU shortages, big scalping problems are still persisting, making the market really tricky at the moment. Even even still, the 5600 XT is a really strong card that is going to give us some great performance figures at 1080p, 60fps in the likes of Apex, Warzone, Cold War, even Cyberpunk is going to work pretty well on this GPU. It's not all about the GPU though, it's also really important to pick up a good CPU, and that's where AMD's Ryzen 5 3600 comes in. Once again, I'm calling on the last gen tech to make this build possible, for a few reasons. 6 cores, 12 threads, some good overclocking support, some nice single threaded and multi threaded performance make it a great all rounder. Plus it is way cheaper, even brand new than a 5600X, the CPU that sort of replaced but not replaced the 3600. As far as the RAM and the storage for this build goes, I've got Corsair's brand new snazzy Vengeance RGB RS. This is a 16 gigabyte kit with a speed of 3600 megahertz, making it perfect for today's build. You want to make sure that you get a Ryzen CPU with 3600 megahertz RAM. If you go too slow, your Ryzen processor is going to say no bueno. It will still work. Your frame rate is just going to be quite a bit lower. We're talking 10, 15% sometimes as far as frame rate goes on Ryzen at least. I'll be matching this up with XPG's Spectrix S20G. This adds a little bit of pizzazz to today's build. It's got a bit of RGB and it looks beautiful. It's sort of an addition to the existing S40G but with a slightly slower speed. You still get decent performance from it. It's still a Gen 3 NVMe drive, and it won't cost you really much more than a non-RGB alternative. This one's one terabyte, but if you want to save some cash, a 500 gig drive is going to work exactly the same, just with a little bit less room. The final components then include our power supply, Deepcool's DQ650M V2L, a unit that thankfully performs a lot better than its complicated name might suggest. With 650 watts of output, an 80 plus gold certification, and a 10 year warranty, it is awesome. Awesome. Truth be told, any 80 plus certified 650 watt power supply will work well today. Going for a unit like this as well means you could swap out for something like a 3060 or 3060 Ti later down the line and not need to change it. The final one of the components then is our case. This is an area where you can go that little bit cheaper if you want to. And that is where the AeroCool Quantum Mesh comes in. Despite its really budget price tag and really small form factor, it supports all the components with upgrades today. It's got RGB 
fans at the front and actually a pretty decent build quality for its price tag that can sometimes be found for the 20s of dollars. Like $29 I think is the cheapest I've seen this case and my god is it a great case for that price point. We'll be coming back to the case in the build process later though. First let's install the CPU into the motherboard, deal with our storage and our RAM or memory. Opening up the motherboard's box and there's a couple of things you want to just grab out before you get too excited. The first is this IO shield. This is a metal rectangular plate which we will need a bit later. Don't forget this, it is quite important. And you also want to take out the actual motherboard itself. There's a few key areas to focus on. This here is our M.2 slot and that's where the storage is going to go. This here is our GPU installation slot where our graphics card's going to pop. These two dim slots here are for our RAM or our memory and this is for our CPU. It's our AM4 Plus CPU socket. Talking to which, let's do that one first. On the underside of AMD CPUs, you'll find all these metal pins. Don't touch them, they're quite delicate, but you'll also find a little bit of a golden triangle. This golden triangle is basically all we need for the processor. We're going to match this up with the triangle on the CPU socket, pull the arm on the socket upwards, line up those triangles we just talked about, and drop the processor into place. You might want to give it a little bit of a wiggle, make sure it's seated correctly before popping the arm back down. It really is as simple as that. Once you've done this, you can move on to the RAM or the memory. You'll see here we've got our RAM dim slots with clips on either side. Pull back the clips on both of these slots which will allow us to latch the memory itself. This Corsair kit is pretty low profile meaning it shouldn't get in the way of any future CPU cooler upgrades although the cooler for this build is going to be nowhere near as far as our RAM dim's height is concerned. All you then need to do is go ahead and find the notch on the RAM dim, line this up with the notch on the RAM dim slot and slide the dim into place. If you've got more slots than you've got dims consult the manual as to which ones you need to use but for us we're just going to pop in both of our dims with both of the slots and that's pretty much it. Finally then, the last thing we need to do before installing the cooler is just to install the storage for this build. I already discussed this M.2 slot a little bit earlier but I didn't point out this, a teeny tiny screw which you'll need to remove with none other than a teeny tiny little screwdriver. Go ahead and do this so the screw is out of the way and then you're able to slide the drive in. You'll want to do this at sort of a 45 degree angle rather than completely flat before pushing the drive down, fastening it back down with the screw we just removed and your storage, your SSD, your M.2 drive is in. Moving on to the cooler then and I've just gone and selected the AMD stock cooler. You actually get this included for free with this Ryzen processor and it does an awesome job of keeping the CPU cool without costing really any cash. We did a video recently comparing the performance on different coolers and the results might surprise you. So go ahead and take a look and make your own conclusions. These will often come with pre-applied thermal paste, but if you've used it before, you will need to drop a dab of your own on before fastening the cooler down through the four holes on our motherboard that are already there. The cooler will then screw in nice and easily. Unlike Intel where you just push it in, you need to use a screwdriver for this one. And that's basically it. Moving on to the case. <laughs> this is the Aero Cool Quantum Med, but you already knew that. I'm, I'm gonna unbox this before we get evicted and then I will, um, I'll, I'll be back with you. <clears throat> Now, as with any case, uh, the best thing to do when you're starting a build is just to remove as many side panels as possible. So for us, we're gonna remove the glass panel on this side, we're going to remove the steel panel on the rear, just to make everything that bit easier to access. Once we've done this, we're able to screw the motherboard in. In order to do this step, you want to grab your motherboard first up, we'll be back with the case in a moment, and locate each of the holes through the board itself. So for us, we've got two along the top, two along the middle, and then a further two across the bottom. These need to match and correspond with the silver or gold standoffs installed in the case. So at a quick look, we've already got two in the top, so that's okay. We've already got two along the middle, but the two in the bottom are actually in the wrong locations. You want to move them from here to here, indicated with the circles on screen. Once you've done this, you can slide the motherboard in, clip the IO shield in, fasten it down, and that's basically it as far as installing the motherboard goes. Once you've done this, you could be all hasty and go ahead and install the GPU right now. But that would be a bad idea and let me tell you why. In its current state, the build's really easy to access. All the cables, all the ports, all the connectors are still in easy reach. Add a big old GPU in the middle of that and you're going to have a few more problems when it comes to plugging things in. That is where the power supply comes in. This unit is actually fully modular as well, meaning we only need to plug in the cables that we actually need to use for the build. But make sure you keep hold of the spare ones as if you upgrade any components, you will need to add some more power in and 
that's where these come into play. As far as the cables, you actually need to go ahead and plug into place though. The first is this motherboard power connector. One end will go to your power supply and that end is split into two. And then the other end will go to the top right hand side of the motherboard. The second is this lovely dual six plus two pin GPU power connector. The eight pin singular side will go to the power supply and then one of our six plus two pin pairs will go to the GPU later. Not just yet though. You also want one of these, a dual four plus four pin CPU power connector. Now this is a bit more difficult to distinguish, but the side that actually splits into two, that's this side here, is what's going to go to your processor in the top left corner of the motherboard, while the side that doesn't split into two is going to go into the power supply itself. Finally, the last of the cables is this, a SATA power connection. You won't need one of these for any drives in this system, but the RGB fans and RGB controller do need one. So go ahead and plug the thin end into the RGB and then the six pin end into the power supply. Screw the PSU into place, get all your cables wired up, and then we're good to go as far as our GPU is concerned after we've finished our front panel cables. Yes, that's right, there's more cabling to do. Those cables in particular are the front panel connectors which power all the ports and IO on top of the case. First is USB 3, the largest of the front panel cables which is notched and will only go in one way. This is followed by a USB 2 connector which looks very similar to our HD audio connector that we'll plug in in a moment but it has a different pin blocked out. Speaking of which, HD audio is next, this goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, followed finally by our JFP1 front panel cables. This is for like our power and reset switch and all that good stuff. These are the fiddly pins that people often complain about, but don't worry, we'll pop a diagram on your screen now so you can follow along at home if you wish. If you get it wrong, don't panic, nothing will explode, you just have to restart and try again. Once this is done though, we can move on to the final component today, the GP. You. The graphics card for this build is the one and only Radeon RX 5600 XT. This particular card is a gigabyte card, although any 5600 XT you can get your hands on is going to work perfectly. This is a great card for 1080p, as we'll test out in more detail later in today's video. It's also a card that you can commonly find on the likes of eBay in good condition secondhand for about $300. In this build, I have accounted for slightly more budget than that as well, just to make it a bit more possible. Plus, on the likes of Newegg, even brand new, there are some deals to be had on this card. If you're really having difficulty finding this GPU though, try something like a GTX 1660 Super or a 1660, as the performance you'll get will be pretty comparable. At this level of GPU, there's no DLSS or no ray tracing to compare against, so the whole AMD versus Nvidia argument is just not quite as substantial. I still think Nvidia's suite of drivers and software is a bit better polished, but as far as raw performance goes, the 5600 XT is as good as it gets at this price point. This card from Gigabyte is great uh, with a decent IO, a plastic backplate and some nice fans keeping it in budget for a system like this. You've got a singular 8 pin power connector which we'll plug up in a moment but first we need to go ahead and install it. Now to do this you want to hover the GPU over the slot and this will tell you which of the rear covers need removing. So for us we need to snap off the second and third PCIe lanes and then the card will nice and easily click into place. We want to secure it down with a screw, give it some power, and then our PC is pretty much ready to go. We aren't quite ready to boot up into games yet though, as before we do that, we need to install Windows, sort all of our BIOS settings, deal with our drivers, and that's the next portion of today's video. In order to do this step, go ahead and plug up your new system to a keyboard, a mouse, and a monitor. You then want to go ahead and turn the PC on, and as it switches on, hit the delete key repeatedly on your keyboard. This is what will trigger your system to go into the BIOS, which is where we can check our RAM speed and all of our other key crucial settings. This may take a little bit of time, but be persistent and you should jump nicely in. There we go, to your motherboard's BIOS. Navigate down to the advanced memory settings and make sure you enable XMP at the top of the page. Select profile one and it should automatically jump the RAM up to 36.00 or 3600 megahertz in our case. Once we've done this, the BIOS is basically complete. For a budget system like this, it's only some very simple settings you want to look at. What you then want to do before actually powering the system down is grab yourself one of these, a bootable Windows USB stick. You can actually make one of these really easily by picking up a 16 gig USB 3 drive and using the tool linked in the description below from the official Microsoft website. That will turn any USB stick into a drive capable of installing Windows. Go ahead and plug this into the back of your system System. Jump over to save and exit using the arrow keys, the far right tab, and then select your Windows boot manager on the USB drive. Go ahead and do this and then we're good to go and we should automatically reboot into Windows. Lovely stuff, that then jumps us into the Windows installation.
installation process. Go ahead and select your language, your time and all that jazz and then go ahead and click install. We can then go ahead and select I don't have a product key, you can activate Windows later no problem and select the Windows version you want to install. Windows 10 Home is good enough for the vast majority of people before accepting all of the terms and conditions, choosing to install Windows only and then selecting the drive to install Windows on. For us this is our simple M.2 SSD. I've said it before but if you've got multiple Windows drives or multiple SSDs and you don't know which is which, pull out the one you don't want to use leaving the one you do and then we can let Windows run through the installation before finishing off later on with any of our privacy, data tracking and personalization settings. This next bit of the process can be the most laborious so we've sped it up for you but we haven't cut anything out, this is exactly what has happened. This can take between 10 and 60 minutes depending on your system in all honesty, just be patient, jump through all of the hoops and then we should be into Windows a little something like this. We're now easily into Windows, that only took us about 10-12 minutes so happy days on that front. I've also gone ahead and plugged in an ethernet cable at this point in time to allow us to obviously install any drivers or applications we need to before we go ahead and get gaming. Jump into a web browser, Edge is currently the only one I have installed so please forgive me and then you want to download some 5600 XT drivers. To do this you can navigate either to the product page on the Gigabyte website or I'm just going to search for AMD Radeon software drivers and just download their overarching software utility from the AMD website. We'll try and link all of these links down in the description as well to make things nice and easy. Hit download and then finally we also need to search up the name of our motherboard which is of course Gigabyte's B450MS2H followed by the word drivers. This is to install the chipset drivers for the B450 chipset, any networking, USB, all those kind of stuff just to make sure everything's working optimally. It can be tempting to jump straight into games, but hold fire, go ahead and install these drivers now. For me, I'm just going to go ahead and install the AMD chipset driver. I'm going to also just download our Realtek LAN driver as well, and that will do me nicely as far as drivers are concerned. Jump through each of the setup processes, your system will restart a few times during this process, uh, and just take it step by step. Once we've done this, we're able to finally jump into the gaming benchmark section of today's video. After, of course, the legendary Geekawatt montage, which is coming up next. I'll see you in a second, but first, roll that montage. The last part of today's video is arguably the most important, how well this machine performs. We've tested out a wide range of titles, some of my favourite titles, some of your guys' favourite titles too, to really put the system through its paces. On your screen now is a summary of all the different games and all the numbers we were able to achieve, but don't click off, don't go anywhere, because we'll be looking at some of these titles one by one. The first of our focus titles today is GTA 5, an older game but a great benchmark test, and at 1080p high settings we managed to achieve 122 frames per second on average. 90 and 99th percentile results were strong and the game looked great. Watch Dogs Legions is a similarly positive story. 1080p high settings yielded 82 FPS on average with 76 and 70 for the 90 and the 99th percentile results. Moving on to Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War in the multiplayer zombies mode at 1080p high settings we got 85 FPS on average with 74 and 65 for the 90 and the 99th percentile results. All around some pretty good results. We're pretty impressed with with these in terms of Call of Duty's Cold War. Next up is Apex Legends. This title is a good test for any system. It's more popular than Warzone at the minute as well and I'm glad to report at 1080p sort of medium settings we got just shy of 120 frames a second. 90 and 99th percentile results were consistently strong too which is always a massive bonus and the game looked great. Moving on to Valorant then here at 1080p high settings we got 320 FPS on average. Valorant more an esports game easier to run kind of like a CSGO and the system handled Valorant incredibly well. It also handled Cyberpunk pretty well believe it or not as well. At 1080p with dynamic fidelity effects enabled, this is kind of an AMD resolution scaler, we managed to achieve 66 FPS on average. Cyberpunk of course one of the worst optimised games as of late so to get these results is damn impressive. Fortnite is next up today, the penultimate title of the focus games. At 1080p competitive settings with everything tuned down to low, the render distance set to far, we got 200 167 FPS on average, with 229 and 199 for the 90 and the 99th percentile results. Finally then, the last game today is Call of Duty's Warzone. Here I'm happy to report some great results as well. 1080p high settings gave us just shy of 95 FPS on average. Once again, the 90 and 99th percentile numbers stacked up very nicely, 
and the game visually looked great. On that note though, that wraps it up for all the gaming benchmarks today and of course uh, the video itself. But don't be sad, we've got lots more builds coming and lots more builds on the channel you can watch as well. Thanks for tuning in though, make sure to get subscribed if you aren't already and as always, we'll see you in the next one.